Welcome to worship everyone. I'm Pastor Corey Lahiri. I want to thank you for joining us online or on the radio, wherever you're watching or listening. I'm glad you're with us. Uh, we're going to take two minutes right now uh, to prepare ourselves for worship. Uh, maybe get your Advent candles ready if you haven't done that, or share this service with somebody online, or invite somebody into the room, uh, or send a, send a message to someone and say, Merry Christmas. Are you are you worshiping anywhere? Who knows what? But you got two minutes to prepare for worship or to connect with someone else. Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Tim Sievers. I'm the Connection Director here at Palouse Federated Church. It's my uh, pleasure, my privilege to be with you uh, this morning. I uh, just want to invite you to turn your attention to these video announcements that we have about some important upcoming events. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have our scripture reading. Hi there, I'm Betty Sawyer, and I would like to invite you to join in a Bible study this next week. It's going to be good for your soul, and it's just fun to get together, although we just get together now on Zoom. 
We'd sure like you to join. Um, I lead a Bible study on Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock, and we can sure help you figure out how to get on Zoom if you haven't joined us yet. So give it a try. Um, we'll show you several more Bible studies throughout the week, and we'd just like you to join us. Hi friends, I want to invite you to a virtual lobby experience at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday, 10.30 a.m. We're going to have a virtual church lobby where you can come and join us for prayer. It's, it's our prayer meeting that we've been having, but it's also a time where you can share about the sermon or ask questions or check in with other people. So 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning, the virtual church lobby, come and join us. I am so excited about some Christmas activities coming up. I'm going to call Tim Sievers. Somebody's calling. Come on, Tim. Pick up, Tim. Okay. Corey Lowry. Hello? Hey, Tim. Hey, what's going on? Did you hear about the Christmas activities coming up? Yeah, what? what? Well, we got what's the Christmas on? program again. The Christmas program for kids is on December oh! 20th. I love the kids' Christmas program. It's, it's amazing. It's back. Yeah, it's back. December it's back? 20th at 6 p.m. Oh. Uh, live online. Facebook online. and YouTube. The Christmas program with cute kids and the Christmas story. December 20th at 6 p.m. And, and Christmas Eve services. There's going to be three this year. Three. 7, 9, and 11 p.m. That's amazing. 7, 9, and 11 p.m. We're going to try to do it outdoors and oh, online. That's great. 7, 9, that's 11. Great. I was just so excited I had to call you. Well, I, I'm excited too. You know, I was just... Here decorating I this you Christmas decorating. tree. Yeah. I, you're right. I was decorating, you know, because I love this time of year. And how great that we can still do those things that we love to do, those traditions that are, you know, our church does. So thanks so much for calling and letting me know. So what was it? It was the the 20th for the kids Christmas program yeah, yeah. online, uh -huh. uh, and then Christmas Eve services on. What, what day is that? It's Christmas December 24th December this year. December 24th this year, okay. 7, 9, 11 7, p.m. And everybody could join us. So we got to get the word out and let other people know somehow. Okay, well, we'll get right on that. I'll let everybody know. All right, cool. see you, Tim. Okay, bye. Bye. I'm Carrie DeRamus, and I will be reading The Call to Worship, Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what the sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And for his kingdom... There will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, a child to be born will be called Holy, and the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who has called barren for nothing will be impossible with God and Mary said behold I am the servant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word and the angel departed from her today is the fourth Sunday of Advent and so we're going to continue uh, our worship with the lighting of the Advent candles We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. We light this candle in joy. 
and we light this candle for love. Would you pray with me? O oh God of love, your coming to us in flesh was not born out of a duty, but out of great unthinkable love. Help us, like Mary, to ponder in our hearts what all of this means. Let us wonder at your love. Out of love, you emptied yourself and became our servant. Out of love, you entered into your creation to have it mock you and put you on trial. Out of love, you turned your face away from your own son so that you could turn our faces to gaze on you. Out of love, you are now preparing a place for us, and you promise you will not leave us as orphans. We are waiting and watching for you. Amen. Amen. Good. Cool. 
Friends, we have a good God, a wonderful God, a God who wants to have relationship with us, even though our God is, you know, the creator of, of he the heavens and earth and is, you know, all wise, all powerful. You know, God is a God who created us to be in loving relationship with us. And part of that, that relationship, a very important part is prayer. And prayer you can do anywhere, out, outside, in your homes right now, in your daily life, at your, at your desk at work, right? Wherever you're at, you can go to God and, and listen to Him and talk with Him, give Him thanks, ask up requests of Him, give Him praise. So I just want to encourage you, whether you're on a walk, you're out, outdoors in God's beautiful creation, spend time with God in prayer. That's, part, that's a big part of your relationship with God. And it's a blessing that we can pray together, even though we're separated by distance right now in this, this time of pandemic and restrictions. And so I'm glad to pray with you. And I want to pray the Lord's Prayer together. I like praying it in, uh, slowly, intentionally uh, slow. And so if that's hard for you, just kind of get over it, that it's slow. And think about the words you're praying in the Lord's Prayer. They'll be up on the screen if you're watching this service online. Uh, but let's pray the Lord's Prayer slowly together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, I rejoice at the goodness of your love. Lord, we are so thankful that we can be people of hope knowing that your promises always come true. You promised to come into the world, and you did. You promised to give us your righteousness, and you did. You promised to be the suffering servant for our sake, and you were. And you promised to come again, and we know that you will. Lord, we have great peace in our soul, knowing that we are your restored children, that you have not abandoned us, but you have adopted us into your family and that we share in your inheritance. We praise you, O Lord, and we rejoice at the goodness of you, God, that we can experience you. Lord, if there's any who are struggling with uh, rejoicing right now, if there's any who are struggling with depression, Lord, anxiety or other struggles, health issues, Lord, we do not look lightly at those situations, but we give thanks that you are with them. We ask for people to come alongside all who are struggling any who are grieving and be your presence to to these folks Lord help them we pray for those recovering from surgery that you would heal them and give them recovery we pray for those who are fighting against disease COVID-19 or other disease Lord that you would be their strength and that they would look to you for their hope we pray for our leaders in our nation O Lord that you would cause them to be loving and just and good we pray for our church in the United States and around the world, O oh Lord, that we would reflect your image, that we would share your good news, that we would be faithful to the mission you gave us, Lord. We pray for our mission here on the Palouse, that you would help us to, to glorify you, to make new disciples, to, to build up one another, Lord. And we pray that it would all honor you. O oh Lord, may your spirit bless all the households that are uh, participating in worship today that are connected to our church. May your spirit meet them in their, their place of need, help them to grow and serve you this week. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next we'll be reading Samuel 2, chapter 7, verse 1 through 11, and verse 16. Now, when the king lived in the house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of the surrounding enemies. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. 
But that same night the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought, I was, since the day I brought up the people from Israel, from Egypt, to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling, in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And a violent man shall afflict them no more as formerly. And from that time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all of your enemies moreover. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. Hey everybody, it's Tim Seavers again. I just want to thank you for your faithful giving to Palouse Federated Church and our mission and ministries. Uh, what a blessing it's been over this last year uh, as you've continued to support us in the midst of the pandemic. We couldn't be more thankful, couldn't be more grateful for you and the gifts that you've offered. And because of your faithfulness and giving, our mission and ministries have moved forward. We've been able to continue uh, having services that are online. We've been able to continue our mission giving to our mission partners here in our area of the Palouse and around the world. Uh, and we couldn't do it without you. Just as a reminder, there are still some special opportunities for giving. Today is the last day to get your Christmas giving in. So if you want to give to support our Uganda Christmas or food vouchers, uh, could you do it today? Drop your gifts off uh, here at the church or give online at palousechurch.org. Uh, just click that online giving button and you can make your designations. That way we can make sure that uh, our Christmas giving goes out to the families uh, that we're working with uh, before Christmas. So again, let me say thank you uh, and express uh, our sincere thanks on behalf of uh, your entire church community. Uh, we're so grateful for your faithfulness and giving.
I have never wanted Christmas so badly. How about you? And, and yet, this year, it isn't Christmas as we normally celebrate it. There are changes aplenty in our culture, right? Uh, there's restrictions, there's the dissension and, and disagreements, there's grief and pain, and we could just generally call it darkness. Uh, this, this Christmas, in a way, might emotionally feel more like the original Christmas. That, that first Christmas occurred under the, the shadow of the despot, the, the tyrannical leader, Herod. And we have a poor young couple struggling to make it to Bethlehem in time, barely able to find a place to have their child. And yet the story of God's first advent, his first coming into the world, is a story that has many points of difficult over the centuries uh, prior to the birth of Jesus. The ancestors of Jesus knew what it was to grieve and to live in dark times. This week, we're going to go back to a powerful story of a woman named Ruth who chose in the midst of darkness to believe in the gift of God's love. Ruth is like the start of, the, the, of Bethlehem, you could say. She's, she brings, in a way, God's love back to Bethlehem and that connects to what God is going to do through Jesus. She's a bright shining light, an example of God's love for us. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are truly our rock. You are our redeemer, Lord. And Lord, teach us about your love, teach us about the example of Ruth, and teach us about your son, Jesus Christ, and in his name I pray, amen, amen. Our scripture today is from the Old Testament in the book of Ruth, uh, and we're in chapter 1. I'm going to just read verses 16 through 18, but I encourage you to read the whole book of Ruth on your own, or at least chapter 1 to get the whole context. But I'm going to read Ruth 1, 16 through 18. But Ruth said, well, I should give you a little context at least, right? They're in a tough situation. Uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, had lost her husband and her two sons, and Ruth was married to one of those sons, and so there's been all this death in the family, and now Naomi is deciding to go back to her homeland, to Judah, to Israel, and, and Ruth is a Moabite from Moab, and Naomi's encouraging Ruth to, to stay with her people, to go back to her people. And, and Ruth is deciding, though, she's going to stay with Naomi. And that's where we pick up the story. Verse 16 of chapter 1. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord, and that's the word Yahweh, the holy name for God, may the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So we see this amazing act of commitment, of love by Ruth to stay with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, was grieving the loss of a husband, the loss of two sons. It was a time of famine and difficulty. And Ruth knew that, that though it would be easier for her on her own to go back to her people in Moab, she decided to help her mother-in-law, who was uh, very vulnerable as, a, as an older widow. And she decided to stay with her and give up her self-rights, uh, you could say, to be with her mother-in-law. And you could say the line of Jesus, this is, this is over a thousand years before Jesus, but this is the lineage of Jesus we're talking about. And the line of Jesus was kept alive in the world by love. The light seemed to be flickering out, but God was keeping it burning with the love of Ruth for her mother-in-law. Ruth shows us selfless, caring love. You see, Ruth didn't uh, just envy or covet the life of other women in Moab. Instead, because she had the love of God in her heart, which she probably learned from Naomi and Naomi's family, God had shaped her heart into someone that loved in the midst of darkness. She didn't, she didn't waste her energy wanting a different life back in Moab. Instead, she, she decided to do what was the best thing right in front of her. What was the best thing for her mother-in-law? And that was to support her and to stay with her. So she did this difficult thing. And she loved fiercely. Uh, she took a hard step. She made a hard choice. 
And that's what we need to do in this year of 2020. We need to love fiercely. We need to be present even when it's difficult. We need to be real about losses and, and struggles, but we need to not give up, to not stop caring for one another, to help one another out when each other are, are down, right? To fight for the good, to look for the kingdom of God, and to let God do God's job of keeping his story alive as we do our job of trusting God and loving others as God loves us. So I want to talk about uh, this situation a bit more and about Ruth's decision to love. So the situation of Ruth and Naomi was this was the time of Judges. They, it starts in the land of Moab over 1,100 years before Jesus' birth. Naomi's husband dies, then her two sons die. She's left with two daughters-in-law, uh, Orpah and Ruth, Moabite, uh, Moabite women that were uh, married to these Israelites. And Ruth, uh, I, I should say, no, Naomi was originally from Judah. And when all the family and her men had died, she, she wants to go back. And that makes sense uh, because she, that's where she's from. That's where she could get some support, perhaps. And she heard that there was some food back in Israel. And so she begins the journey, and she begins the journey with her daughters-in-law back to her ancestral home in Judah. But in verse 8, we read that she told each of her daughters uh, to return home. You can see that in verse 8, to their, to their homes, to their family, and to their religion. Uh, and she says, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me, uh, with the dead and with me. So she's giving them permission to leave and to, to go home. She's essentially telling them that their obligation to her as daughters is over. She is thanking them for how they loved her boys, how they took care of her, and she tells them to go home and find husbands for themselves because she won't be able to provide a husband for them. She's too old. She, even if she got married that day, she says, and had a child, would they wait for that child to grow up and marry? Uh, no. Uh, so she's too old and it's too long to wait, even if Naomi could conceive a child. And so she's telling them, go, go back home. But, but as we see this story unfold, Ruth makes a radical decision. Uh, Ruth makes the decision to love Naomi and not let go. To love Naomi and not let go. We see Ruth's selfless, selflessness and loyalty. And it's a great example of the type of love that we hear in the New Testament called agape love. Agape love, the perfect love like God has for us. Agape love is a love that wants the best for others. A love that does not give up on other people, even in hard situations. And so she says, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Some of the most dramatic words in the Old Testament, I think. This is, this is self-sacrificing love. She's putting uh, Naomi above her self-interest. Uh, and it's love that is willing to go all the way to the grave. All the way to the grave to show itself true. And, and, and Ruth says to Naomi to make sure that her, she knows her promise is serious. She says, may the Lord, may Yahweh, the holy God, invoking the holy name of the God of Israel, the one true God, may Yahweh do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. You see, she's using Jewish language here. Even though she's a Moabite by her, her genealogy, Ruth is using Jewish language here for God, the one holy God. I am who I am. Uh, and she's, she's showing that she has faith in this God. This God, the God of Naomi's family, Ruth has faith in this God. And she's making a personal covenant, a personal promise, basically saying, I will, I will serve you, I will stay with you until death. And if I, if I depart from you, may I die, and may something even worse than death happen to me. So why is she doing that? Why is she not looking after her own self-interest? It's kind of natural as us as human beings to have self-interest and to look out for the unholy trinity, right? Me, myself, and I. But so why is she, why is she going against that, the grain of our, our natural human instinct to have self-preservation? What does this older lady have to offer? Why would she, why would she stay with her? And to ask what does Naomi have to offer, offer Ruth uh, is really maybe the wrong type of question. Because uh, love's answer to that question is, Ruth is loving Naomi for Naomi's sake, not what she can get out of Naomi, but she's loving Naomi to love Naomi. Uh, she's loving her for her sake. She's loving her to honor God. The person that you love is the reason that you love. You love them because they're a person that God has created. 
they're made in the image of God and because God is God of love, we love others. Not because of what we can get out of it, but because we were made to receive love and give love. So Ruth loves Naomi because she loves Naomi, to put it really simply. She is not loving Naomi out of obligation. She's been freed from her. Woo! She's been freed from her obligation to love Naomi. Uh, now, I want to point out that obviously, obviously Naomi and her family had practiced their Jewish faith. Though they left their ancestral homeland, they, they practiced their, their faith enough that they taught, they taught Ruth uh, their faith and, and some of their customs, likely. And we see that if you continue in the book of Ruth, Naomi teaches uh, Ruth some other customs about her faith and her tradition. So uh, Ruth is a believer in, in Yahweh. Ruth uh, came into a relationship with God and, and, and also therefore has God's love in her life and love for her in-laws. And she chooses to respond to the love that, that she had experienced from them, from Naomi's family, with her loyal love. She loves and will not let go. And so Ruth is, ex is an example, Ruth is an example of God's love for us. Our God who loves us and will not let us go. Our God's love for us is what, a love that loves us and will not let us go. And Ruth is an example of that. Our God is a God who doesn't let the darkness win. Our God doesn't let the darkness win. And I love Ruth here just kind of in the midst of this difficult situation, death and famine. She's basically saying, it doesn't make sense for me to stay with you, Naomi, but I'm going to stay with you because I'm not going to let this, this broken world and how it, it, it beats us down sometimes, I'm not going to let it win. I'm going to go against that and I'm going to stay with you. And that is uh, reminiscent or reminds us of God's, God's love for us, God's decision to love and not let go. And that's what Advent and Christmas is all about. It reminds us each and every year of God's mission to come into the world to love broken people, to come into the world to rescue us and to be with us. God's love would not leave us abandoned, right? God would not let the darkness of the world win. So God chose to come to us. God chose to be Emmanuel, God with us, right? So what is God doing? We could say, what does God have to gain uh, by loving us in that way? And again, that's not the right type of question. God loves because that's God's nature. He doesn't love because what he can get out of it, that's self-interest, right? God loves because that's who God is. So just like in the story of Ruth, Ruth loves Naomi because she loves Naomi. God loves you because God loves you. <laughs> that's who God is and he made you to love you. God doesn't love us because we've earned it. So if you think you've fallen short or so, in some way, well, admit where you've fallen short, but you're, you're still loved. God still loves you. We can't earn God's love. We can't pay God back for his love. We can love others out of response to how God loves us, but just know this, God simply loves you. He loves you and wants you to receive that love and share it with others. So God is not deterred by the conditions around us, by the, the coldness of this world, right? Uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And when life looks dark to us, when the world looks dark to us, it is not dark to God. Go check out Psalm 139 and it says, uh, the darkness is as light to you, O God. When the darkness feels really dark to us, it's not darkness to God. God can still see, God can still pierce our darkness. So Naomi and Ruth, they lived in a time of famine. It looked bleak. It looked like death was near for them. There's, there are two widows in a time of famine, right? Very difficult. But what was dark for the world at that time was not dark for God. God had a plan. God always has a plan. God was working to, the, to bring his story, the story of bringing the light of God into the world. God was working to, to involve Naomi and Ruth in his great story. They not only survive, you can read the whole book, four chapters, right? They not only survive, but God eventually provides a husband for Ruth. And they have a child. Ruth and Boaz have a child, Obed. And Obed uh, has, a, has a child, Jesse. And Jesse has children. And one of those children is David, King David. Uh, and Jesus comes out of that line of King David, uh, out of the, the, the town of Bethlehem. So God kept the, the, the story of his love for the world alive through this Moabite, this non-Israelite, through love, through her committed choice to love 
her mother-in-law in the time of grief, even when her mother-in-law was probably struggling with her faith. You can see some of that in the book of Ruth. Naomi was struggling a bit, but Ruth knew that Naomi was a good person, a God follower, and she was going to stay faithful to her even in the midst of this struggle. And so Ruth, the Moabite, who becomes a God follower, ends up in the lineage of Jesus. You can see that in Matthew chapter 1. She's one of the women in, uh, mentioned directly in the lineage of Jesus, even though it was pretty radical to mention women in genealogies. Uh, the Matthew genealogy has multiple women mentioned, and Ruth is one of them. So we, we see God's decision to love us even when it's dark. Now we need to think about our decision, your decision, your de decision to love. Because love is not just an emotion, folks. It's not just affection. Love is, is the state of operation in which we are to live in. And it involves our choices and our commitments, our actions. I, I don't think Ruth loved because she knew that, oh, if I do the right thing here, I'm going to be in the lineage of the Messiah right? She, she didn't know that, but she, she had the experience of God's love in her heart. And so she did the, rex, the next right thing, the next right thing she knew to do. And that was to take care of this beloved person in her life, her mother-in-law. And in, so, in doing that, in so doing, or in doing that, she, she loved Naomi, her mother-in-law. And in a sense, she was participating in the kingdom of God. And that's our choice. Are, are we participating in the kingdom of God and living in God's love or more in the kingdom of this world? Uh, are, we, are we operating in the kingdom of self-interest and what's best for me, myself, and I? Are we, are, we, are we envious of others' lives? You know, are we choosing to say, no, I want the life God has given me, however hard it is, whatever grief I have to go through. And I want to love the people God has put in my life. I want to love the neighbors around me. I want to find ways to even love the people who disagree with me, my enemies. You know, am I choosing to live in the way of love, the way of the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ has brought into the world? So we need to make that decision like Ruth made the decision to love Naomi. We have decisions. You have decisions in your life right now. You have some people that are hard to love, or you have some tough situations in your life where it's hard to stick with a situation or stick with a person. But God can help us, friends, in those situations. Okay, we don't have to do it on our own strength, but you gotta choose to love. It's a decision, it's an action, it's a commitment, it's a promise. So, God has loved us. The King has come. And he, had, he loved us to the point of death. Ruth made her promise. She said, I'll go even to the grave for you, Naomi. Jesus' promise was, I'll go to the grave. And he literally did go to the grave for us. And then he was resurrected for our sake. So, so we as Christians find uh, this amazing love of God that he has for us. But we know sometimes in our own lives, our own love is, is far too shallow. Far too shallow. We can't just do it on our own. It's not just about mustering up affection, right? It's about living day-to-day uh, -day with real choices, practicing our faith, letting uh, God get into our hearts like, like God got into the heart of, of Ruth, okay? That means spending time with God, reading about Jesus in the Gospels, reading the Scriptures, experiencing the love of God in your life, in prayer times, in worship. You got to make those choices, right? And when we find our love running thin, our resources of love, we got to realize, oh, I'm supposed to be depending on God's resources of love, right? And in the midst of darkness, dark times, the good news is His resources of love never run out. The steadfast love of God never runs low, right? Never runs low. It's greater than all the water and all the oceans. It's greater than all the stars in all the universe. God's lo love resources never run low. So we know that God's, God's light, God's light wins. God's light wins. He came into the world as Jesus Christ and he is going to come again one day. He is not going to abandon us. His love is fierce and good for us, friends. So do not give up. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that though this world can be cold and difficult at times, your love is, is always good and warm and true and present and your resources never run out. God, help us to, to be filled with your love and to choose to love today, 
to choose to live in your way of love. Help us to experience anew your love for us so that we can share your love with others, no matter the situation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So friends, I have some next steps for you that could maybe help this message uh, connect with real life for you. First next step, first step is in order to have this love of God for others that we're talking about, you've got to receive the, the love that God is offering you. You've got to receive the love of God that he's offering you. Some of us uh, feel shame about something and we think that God can't love us or, or we've got some struggle or some issue in our past and we're not really receiving God's love. Friends, receive God's love. That's why he created you, to, to share the love of God with you. So that's one step. Make a decision today. Here's another step. Make a decision here today to be a humble, loyal, courageous person towards someone who is struggling. There's probably someone in your life right now that's struggling. Maybe you are the person struggling and you need someone else to live to lift you up, right? And, I, and, and I'm going to be praying that there, there's someone for everybody, right? But maybe you are someone right now that feels like, I can, I can be like Ruth to Naomi right now. God has blessed me and I can serve someone who is struggling. So choose to love and not let go. And I will say to someone out there, if you are struggling, it, it might be good for you to come alongside and love someone anyway, even though it, it could be easy to say, well, I don't have the energy to love someone else. Pray to God for help and, and come alongside someone and admit your struggle, and, but, but show love and loyalty to that person. So, Friends, we have to have this real love in this world to commit to love even to the point of death, to have that Christ-like love in our life. Can you commit to that today? To have Christ-like love in your life, loving others even to the point of death because that's how God loved us. Thanks be to God for his word.
Friends, God's love doesn't let the darkness win. No matter the difficulty or darkness in this world or in our lives, God's love is always greater. So what path uh, is your life on? Are you on God's path of love, believing that His light is always greater than any darkness? I pray that you are. May the light of God light up your life this week. Amen. and girls, moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas and everyone in the whole world because the story I'm sharing with you today is the greatest story ever told. It's the story of Jesus' birthday and that's why we have Christmas. I'll be sharing with you from the Jesus Storybook Bible, which is a great one if you don't have one at your house. It's written for kids to understand and adults to enjoy also. Now all the first part of the Bible was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And it was, but it was foretelling or a prophecy of what would happen. Now God knew because God knew everything but the people wondered, when, when is this present from God going to come? God has promised to help his people from the beginning. But how would he come? And what would he be like? And what would he do? Mountains have, would have bowed down and seas would have roared and trees would have clapped their hands. But the earth held its breath. As silent as snow falling, he came in. And when no one was looking in the darkness, he came. Now there was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Now Joseph was the great, 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 great grandson of King David. One morning, this girl named Mary was minding her own business in her own bedroom when suddenly a great warrior of light appeared to her. It was Gabriel, and he was an angel, a special messenger from heaven. When she saw the tall, shining man standing there, Mary was frightened. You don't need to be scared, Gabriel said. God is very happy with you. Mary looked around to see if perhaps he was talking to someone else. Mary, Gabriel said, and he laughed with such gladness that Mary's eyes filled with tears. Mary, you're going to have a baby, a little boy, and you will call him Jesus. He is God's own son. He's the one. He will rescue the entire world. The God who flung planets into space and kept them whirling around and around. The God who made the universe with just a word. The one who could do anything at all was making himself small and coming down as a baby. Wait! God is sending a baby to rescue the world? But it's too wonderful, Mary said, and she felt her heart beating hard. How can this be true? Is anything too hard for our wonderful God? Gabriel asked. So Mary trusted God more than her eyes could see, and she believed. I am God's servant, she said, whatever God says. I will do. Sure enough, it was just as the angel had said. Nine months later, Mary was almost ready to have her baby. Now Mary and Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem, the town King David was from. But everyone was there to pay their taxes. And when Mary and Joseph reached the little town, 
they found every room was full. Every bed was taken. <laughs> Go away, the innkeepers told them. There isn't any place for you here. Well, where would they stay? Soon Mary's baby would come. They couldn't find anywhere except an old tumble-down stable, kind of like the one I use for my manger. And so they stayed there with the cows and the donkeys and the geese and the sheep and the dove. And there in the stable amongst all the animals in the quiet of the night, God gave the world his wonderful gift. The baby that would change the world was born, his baby son, Jesus. Mary and Joseph wrapped him up to keep him warm, and they made a soft bed of straw, which was from the animal's feeding trough. That worked as his cradle. And they gazed in wonder at God's great gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mary and Joseph named him Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us. Because, of course, he had. The next part of our story is the light of the whole world. This is the story of the shepherds, also from Luke 2. That same night, amongst the other stars, suddenly a bright new star appeared. Of all the stars in the dark vaulted heavens, this one shone clearer. It blazed in the night and made the other stars look pale beside it. God put it there when his baby son was born to be a spotlight shining on him, lighting up the darkness, showing the people the way to him. You see, God was like a new daddy. He couldn't keep the good news to himself. He had been waiting all these years for this moment, and now he wanted to tell everyone. So she pulled out, so he pulled out all the stops. He sent an angel to tell Mary the good news. He had put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was. And now he was going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. He's here, he's come. Joy to the world, the Lord has come, my little boy. Now where would you send your sp splendid choir? to a big concert hall maybe, or a palace perhaps. God sent his to a little hillside outside of a little town in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy old bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside Bethlehem. And the shepherds were very plain people, but some people thought they were smelled bad and they called them bad names and they laughed at the shepherds. You see, people thought the shepherds were nobodies, just scruffy old riffraff. But God must have thought the shepherds were very important indeed because they were the first ones he chose to tell the good news. That night, some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly the sheep became startled and darted away. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What was that? A wing beat? They turned around. Standing in front of them was a huge warrior of light, blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone, everywhere. Today in David's town in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go and see him. He's sleeping in a manger. Behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud, except that it wasn't a cloud, it was angels. Many, many angels armed with light, and they were singing a beautiful song. 
Glory to God, to God be fame and honor and all our hoorays. Then as quickly as they appeared, the angels left and the shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep and raced down the grassy hill through the gates of Bethlehem, down the narrow cobblestone streets, through a courtyard, down some steps and more steps and more steps yet, past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumble-down stable. They caught their breath, then quietly they tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They had heard about this promised child, and now he was here, heaven's son, the maker of the stars, a baby sleeping in his mother's arms. This baby would be like that bright star shining in the sky that night, a light to light up the whole world, chasing away darkness, helping people to see. And the darker the night got, the brighter the star would shine. Next week, boys and girls, I'll be telling you more about the story of when Jesus was born. It's the story of the three kings, sometimes called the wise men, who came to worship Jesus and bring him gifts. Have a wonderful week, and remember, God's best gift to us was his son, Jesus.